Kathy, we would like to welcome you to the 19th Annual Whalen Symposium. I'm really excited about today, and you should be too. We've got a great lineup of posters and presentations. We have an awards ceremony, or we have an awards session at the noon hour, and at the end of the day, we have um, award presentations, or we have presentations of awards to those students. And of course, starting us off, we have Madison Mangano and Dr. Luke Keller, who will be giving us a keynote um, presentation, which promises to make astrophysicists of us all, I think. I'm hoping that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so uh, before we get to that, I want to give you a brief uh, overview of the symposium. As you may know, the symposium uh, is in honor of past President James J. Whalen, whose strong dedication to student-faculty collaboration has continued here at Ithaca College and beyond, as we've had students presenting at regional, national, and international conferences. Today we have 420 students, 65 faculty members, and they'll be showcasing 326 different oral and poster presentations in research, scholarship, and creative work. And this is representing departments and areas from all across campus. So whether you're here today as a presenter, a mentor, or a supporter, I encourage you to step outside of your discipline or area, check out a presentation on something you know nothing about, ask questions, make connections. This is your day. Celebrate it. And I want um, to bring up one of the students on the Whalen Steering Committee, Anna Gardner. She has a brief, very important announcement for you. Hi there. I am one of the students on the Whalen Steering Committee. We have two. The other is Drew Olkowski. I don't know if he's in here. We both do a lot of work, but as the uh, young students on the team, we get to do social media. So if you are here today and you are taking pictures or sharing anything about the symposium, our official hashtag is JJ Whalen Symposium. You'll see it. You can find it on our Facebook page. Everything is just Whalen Symposium or James J. Whalen Symposium. You can go, I know, like the Ithaca College page um, has mentioned us too. If you can't find us, you can find us that way. So make sure to do that. We want to be able to share pictures from students' perspectives, faculty's perspectives, or anybody who's here watching. So please take lots of pictures and share them with us. We can't wait to see them, and I might even retweet them. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, and now the moment you've been waiting for. I'd like to introduce to you Madison Mangano and Dr. Luke Keller. Uh, Madison is a senior in the Department of Physics and Astronomy with minors in honors and math. She'll be presenting on her senior thesis with her mentor, Dr. Keller, who is um, a professor of physics and astronomy and a co-investigator on a team that designed and built an infrared camera and spectrometer for NASA. The title of their presentation is Listening to the Atoms and Molecules of Distant Solar Systems. Please join me in welcoming Madison Mangano and Dr. Keller. All righty, I'm short. There we go. Thank you guys so much for coming in this morning. Um, it is an absolute honor to be here. I'm so excited. Um, so essentially, hold on. Okay, so we're going to be listening to, as we said, atoms and molecules in the solar systems. We're studying the formation of young solar systems. These um, things are stars that are surrounded by clouds of dust um, that will soon become planets just like the ones, the one that we're standing on or sitting on currently. Um, information that we get from these are often offered in what we call light spectra, um, and so it's the it's graphs of stars that are represented in the amount of different types of light coming out of these. Light spectra, though, are often very cryptic. They're kind of dense. Um, people get PhDs in spectral analysis in order to be able to understand what they're seeing when they look at light spectra. Um, so in order to try and make this more accessible, try and make these graphs more accessible and say, hey, we understand what you know, um, young stars are doing and what their solar systems are forming like, um, we thought that we might try and make uh, the spectrum more accessible to broader audiences um, through a process called sonification. Now it's turning, the official definition of sonification is um, the representation of any kind of data through non-speech audio. Um, 
the basic goal of what we're doing here is to create a more intuitive and accessible way of looking at these really, really rich um, graphs that offer a lot of information to audiences that are not specialists, so don't have PhDs in spectral analysis, people who um, have some kind of learning disability, some kind of visual impairment, or um, something like that. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So first I'm going to grab your attention and kind of get a couple, actually a few, um, graphical representations with common sounds that you understand. So the first one that we're starting with um, is a pattern that looks like this. Now people can see that there is um, a rhythmic pattern. You can see that there are two peaks here, here, here. And so you might be thinking to yourself, gee, I wonder what this sounds like. Looking at it, you might not be so sure. However, upon listening, turns out that it's a sound that you know quite well. It's an electrocardiogram with a heartbeat. Next, you've got a graph that looks like this. Now, this is a waveform of another type of sound that, again, looks rhythmic. Again, is kind of decreasing along here. Um, and so you might be thinking to yourself, all right, I have a better idea of what this might look like, but still not so sure when, in fact, If you've ever listened or watched a movie with some kind of submarine, you'll hear these things. Sonar pings are how submarines um, see the bottom of the ocean floor so that they don't run into it. Um, so, so, so um, yeah, uh, so <laughs> graphs like this are something that you might not see every day. However, the sounds are very, very noticeable. Um, this one is going to be a bit less uh, common for people, however. Um, it's also quite noticeable once I will tell you what it is. And so this is a vinyl record scratch. Um, something that you'll notice here is that on the top you've got the same kind of consistency right here, when in the fact it actually falls down on the bottom. Um, so that's another really cool one. And for the last graphical example, we're going to look at this guy. Now this guy has a couple um, different beats. You might be asking to yourself, gee, what does this sound like? Um, when it's... Who said Morse code? <laughs> Good. Um, so this is, we tried actually translating this, it turns out to be just gibberish, but it's Morse code nonetheless. Um, <laughs> um, so these are on earth examples of you can hear sounds and easily interpret what they're going to um, be like because your ears are accustomed to doing it every day. You're doing it as I'm creating sounds with my voice right now, you do it with basically every waking moment. We're going to move a little further out from ground-based sounds. Um, this is a graph of radio frequency coming out of our solar system. So what you can see down here is time going out. And so you look at different types of radio emissions from local, from things on Earth, from uh, guys in Jupiter, to these uh, high peaks over on the sun. Um, what you're looking at over here is a frequency, and these actually sound really, really cool. Not sure if everyone can hear that. Yeah? Cool. And so it has that quiet kind of chirping that you'd expect, and um, looking at these kinds of things raises the question of what exactly are we looking at here? And so the most important aspect of this graph is frequency. Now frequency is a term that we use to um, talk about how things are, it's basically how things are measured. Um, so say you've got radio emissions, which is a type of light wave, it's a long range light wave, coming out of different um, solar system objects. Uh, those hit a detector, a telescope, a spectrograph, something like that, and they hit it a certain amount of times per second. And that is how we measure frequency. Um, you'll see that these guys are actually on the order of kilohertz, which means that it's hitting it in thousands of times per second. And so at the bottom there you see the 200, that is 200,000 signals per second that is being emitted at that low range. And you'll see it goes way higher than that. Um, so that is how a lot of how we look at frequency. Frequency is important because it represents um, the signals coming out of stellar objects, as well as the sounds that are hitting your ears. They're coming in as a frequency. Um, and so that's how we relate them. So there we go. Some of you in the audience might be wondering, hey, what is that actually? 
Um, sound actually can't travel through the vacuum of space. You kind of need air in order to vibrate those things. Um, and so what we're actually looking at is not, or what we're hearing is not sound traveling through space. It is the light traveling through space, and that's what we measure. However, we're turning that signal frequency into a sound pitch, which is also uh, registered as a frequency. Um, so that kind of direct translation helps you hear different types of um, signals that are coming into detectors. Um, and so that direct translation on the vertical axis means that you can essentially hear objects in the solar system like we just did. It's a type of energy transformation as well. So you're going to be taking electromagnetic energy, which is light. It's the light that's shining into my eyes currently. It's the light that you see coming off of my jacket. Um, it's all hitting your eyes with a frequency. And so that energy is being turned into a sound instead with what the program that we're working with. I've got two, two more examples for you here. Um, this one is called a pulsar. It's a collapsed spinning neutron star. These things are extremely massive, about two to three times the size of our sun. Um, they're spinning on an axis extremely fast. Now, we've chosen a pretty slow one for you. And I'm going to play this little video um, that's going to show up in here. And what I want you to know is that you're looking at frequency on the vertical axis, and every time the peak of the frequency increases, and you'll see it has a very rhythmic um, beat, Every time that happens, this massive star is rotating once on its axis. And that is pretty fast. And this is a slow one. <laughs> so again, what you're looking at is radio intensity and this being um, expelled from, this, uh, from the pulsar. You can see an artist rendition up here. So these giant jets that are coming out of it is what we're looking at and what we're measuring. And so it's spinning that fast, which is really cool. All right, the last example I've got for you, I kind of had to include, it's been in the news recently. Um, it was the uh, merging of two black holes that were actually measured here on Earth. Um, this is, again, an artist's rendition of what it would look like. However, it's not that far off. Um, and so what you've got here is that you have these two black holes that are very close to each other. And you can't see it in the picture because it's a picture. But they're rotating around each other really fast. What's going to happen is that their gravity will attract each other. And they're going to rotate faster and faster and faster until they become one. And so I'm going to play the sound of it for you here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> that is, this is, that is one, probably my favorite sound in this presentation. <laughs> so that chirp actually looks something like this. Um, now, you might, be, you might have seen this. It's, um, again, been in the news really recently. It's really exciting stuff. Um, what you're looking at here is not actually frequency coming in, but rather space distortion. And so the merging of these black holes literally distorted space and time enough that it was able to bend light here on Earth, and we were able to capture it with, um, at two different sites at Hanford and Livingston. Um, and so you'll see that the space distortion is over here on the vertical axis. And what I want you to think about is that this is actually happening just over a tenth of a second. Um, and so here you can see this is in seconds. You're going from 0.3 to 0.45. Now, the fact that we were able to detect this is truly, truly amazing. I'm going to play the sound one more time. Um, what I want you to notice here is that rather than listening to a frequency, um, you're listening to the space distortion. However, you can relate it back to frequency. Um, and so you can see here that there are different peaks with the data that you're seeing up here, up here, up here. Um, and the peaks are actually getting closer together, which is really cool, because you can hear that the sound, the pitch of the um, frequency with which those beats are hitting is getting closer and closer together, meaning that you're going to be getting that higher pitch. And so it makes a bit more sense when you think about it like that. And so you can see that it's kind of going woo. <laughs> makes me so happy. <laughs> Um, so that's a really cool example that has um, recent importance. Okay, I lied. This, this is the last example. <laughs> um, so what you're looking at here is actually the interaction of the Earth's magnetosphere um, with solar wind. Um, this makes a really cool kind of dolphin whale sound, as I'm sure you'll hear in a second. Um, you've got two different graphs that you're looking at here. One is um, 
intensity and one is frequency. And so you're looking at it as time progresses. And so you can measure how these things change with time. Um, all of the ones that I've shown you thus far are called a time series. Um, and so it makes a lot more sense intuitively to say, this is how something's changing with time. And so you might be asking, what does this sound like? And so this is solar wind hitting the upper magnetosphere of our own planet. So what we're going to do actually, though, is um, take a small slice of this. Now, something that um, you might not be thinking of is that with studying the young formation of stars, um, these things happen over the course of like 50 to 100 million years, don't exactly have that kind of time to measure the changes. So we're going to be looking at just a snapshot of what we have currently. Um, so what we're going to do is take this snapshot. And so right at that two second mark, you can see the red line. And then we're going to turn it into a graph that looks like this. And so taking both of those, taking all of that information that we already have, we're just going to take a snapshot in time. And so you're map mapping intensity on the uh, vertical axis. And so you can see how much of a certain frequency is being emitted. And so you can see there in the middle, this one, um, this frequency of about one is hitting about the highest peak. Um, and then it kind of drops off from there on either side. Um, this is called a spectral series and is more of what we look at with, um, with our research because, again, you can only take a snapshot of what stars are doing. They don't really change all that fast. A little taller. <laughs> uh, so I want to give you some context for the research. Madison, I think, has done a great job of, of showing you how we interpret sound very well every day and how we can change uh, an intensity that is not sound into sound so that we can interpret it with our ears instead of our eyes. Uh, so uh, when we're studying the distant solar systems, which you'll get to see in a moment and you'll get to interpret yourselves, uh, we're looking at light from obviously a very uh, distant object and uh, that we observe as a light spectrum. And as Mag Madison said, these spectra are a little bit difficult to interpret, so we're going to turn them into sonified spectra, sound spectra. So we're using the Spitzer Space Telescope. It's kind of like the Hubble Space Telescope, but it works in the infrared part of the spectrum. And um, as an example, we took a picture of a light in our laboratory. This is just a, a torch lamp uh, to show you how the spectrum is produced. You've all seen this probably. If you put white light through a crystal, a prism in this case, it spreads the light into the rainbow of colors. And what we like to do in order to interpret these uh, to infer physical characteristics like temperature, density, chemical composition of the forming solar systems is to make a graph of intensity versus frequency, like this one here. The higher frequency light is blue. That's how our brains interpret high frequency light. The low frequency light is red. So when we sonify, we'll be turning blue into high pitch and red into low pitch. So the graph that, that Madison just showed you is a sound spectrum, and uh, we're going to turn our light spectra, the spectrum on the right, into a sound spectrum, like the one on the left, and then play it as an audio. So uh, we got to uh, do a quick um, uh, overview of how, how these solar systems form, because it's, it's actually uh, helpful to have a picture in your head of what's going on as we listen to these, and as we, as we basically listen to the data. Uh, so uh, in the constellation Orion uh, is the great nebula in Orion. It's actually one of the uh, few uh, objects in the sky that is a, a massive star-forming region that you can see with the naked eye, usually not from here in Ithaca, but with binoculars. You don't need a big telescope. So this is a giant cloud of gas, and in the densest part of this cloud, the um, density enhancements are actually collapsing and by when the they force collapse, of gravity. They form stars. And some of those stars actually have disks of dust and gas surrounding them, orbiting them. This is an actual picture from the space, Hubble Space Telescope of the star, and you can see in still silhouette a disk, kind of like a pizza orbiting, and it's from this orbiting material that the planets form, that our solar system formed when, uh, from which our solar system formed when the sun formed, and what we're looking at here is a newly forming solar system uh, about 1,500 light years away. A light year is six trillion miles, so really far away, but about 1,000 years ago. So it's still forming. Uh, and this is kind of a cartoon that shows you, that'll give you an idea of how we cor correlate the spectra, which are somewhat difficult to interpret, 
to what's actually happening, to a picture. So in the top frame is a plain star, just a boring star. No, no, nothing, no pizza orbiting it, no dust, no gas. And the spectrum, which is on the right, is frequency on the horizontal increasing to the left, and intensity on the vertical axis increasing upward. And you can see that it's a downward sloping line. So that's what a boring star looks like. If you have gas and dust orbiting that star, then you can see that the spectra cha spectrum changes. The spectral response is now flat, it's not a decreasing, and it has bumps and wiggles. And those bumps and wiggles actually have a tremendous amount of information in them about those physical characteristics that we're so interested in, in uh, learning. And then finally, as planets begin to form, they begin clearing out the material that's orbiting the star. And you can see in the lower picture that the central part of the disk is actually cleared of material. That's because planets formed from that material. And that changes the spectrum as well. You can see that the spectrum is low intensity at the high frequency side and high intensity at the low frequency side. So the, the, the takeaway here is that the spectrum changes as the physical conditions of the system change. Most of these are so far away that we can't see them if we take pictures. They look like stars, and you can't see the disk. Uh, however, this is one example of a protoplanetary disk that is close enough to be actually imaged. So this is a real picture, infrared picture, of one of these disks. This is the spectrum of that disk. So this, now we're going from schematic data to actual data. And we can see that this disk from the picture has gaps in it. That, from that, we would infer that planets have formed. And uh, the spectrum is faint at the high frequency side, bright at the low frequency side. And that's an artist's rendition of what it might look like if you flew in your favorite spacecraft to actually take a picture close up. So we're really interested in the formation of planets for many reasons. Are we alone? How did our solar system form? And so it's looking at these very primordial systems uh, that we begin to get a glimpse of how um, our solar system formed. And there's the data. This is when you fall out of your chairs. <laughs> right? This is it. This is state of the art. Space telescope data. And, um, as you can see, it's very complicated looking. Um, the thing to notice, of course, is that they're all different. These, each of these spectra, each of these graphs, is a different forming solar system. We have thousands of these things. But it's really cryptic. As, as Madison was saying, it takes a while to learn to interpret these graphs. And in a talk like today, where we have people from broad range of backgrounds and experience with spectra, I don't want to be spending the, I just spent five minutes explaining the spectra. What I'd like to do is get you excited about the forming solar systems. So, um, this is why we decided to try sonification. This is just too much information. Okay, so take data from the telescope, and it generates a spectrum. That's intensity, infrared intensity in this case, as a function of light frequency. Uh, change that to sound intensity as a function of sound frequency, and we just map the spectra, the, the, the differences in color, to the range of human hearing from about 20,000 hertz, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, so the full range of human hearing. And then generate a wave file, play it on the iPod. <laughs> so this is the section where your ears are about to be a little unhappy. Um, so what we've got here are two examples of um, spectra that you possibly could see. Um, these are ones that I built over the summer um, to model what we might be looking at. So on the left-hand side, you can see a graph that is actually similar to what Luke showed you with the boring star. So what you're seeing here is on the left-hand side, you're getting frequency increasing that way, um, which means that the higher frequencies are going to translate to higher pitches. Um, from there, you have those at higher intensities as well, so the higher pitches are going to be quite a bit louder. Let me see if that will play. I spent all summer listening to that. It's great. 
On the right hand side, uh, conversely, you see that those higher pitches are actually at lower intensities and so they won't be as loud. Um, as you move towards the right, you get into lower frequency which translate into lower pitch. However, those are at higher intensities and so it's going to be a lot louder, those lower pitches. And so I'm going to play that for you right now. And so you can definitely hear that the lower pitches are a lot um, more they're a lot louder, they're a lot more vibrant um, in those things. Another thing that I did last summer was I built a program that models a comparison. And so what's actually gonna happen is that the next sound that I'm playing you is gonna be taking both of these and going back to back. So flipping it kind of like that old Pong game, if anyone remembers that. Um, I don't remember that, so <laughs> I'm young. Um, so I'm gonna play that for you right here and I'm gonna use my laser pointer to uh, show you which one is being played at the time. Um, and so these are just models of what we're going to be uh, looking at. Next, we've actually got real stars, which are way more way cooler than um, the examples that I built. And so what you're looking at here are two different examples of what when you have warm dust and when you have cool dust surrounding a star in that pizza shape that Luke was talking about earlier. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see that there's that big peak, that uh, large feature on as you get into higher frequencies, and so that's going to have a very high-pitched sound, as well as the decreasing um, continuum on the right-hand side of that graph. And so you're going to have those lower pitches be very, very faint in comparison. And so there's a lot higher pitches um, being played there. Uh, again, conversely, on the um, right-hand side, you've got a disk of cool dust surrounding the star, um, and so you're going to be hearing a lot more of those um, louder, lower frequency, which are low-pitch um, sounds being played. That one's pretty cool, I think. Again, we're going to listen to the comparison, and so you can definitely hear the differences between high pitch, high frequency, high intensity, low pitch, low frequency, high intensity, um, and you can see exactly where those sounds switch out when you hear them. Um, and so those are examples of how you can look at stars, get a sort of understanding of what you're seeing, and then um, think about what it's going to sound like as well. And so from, ga from gathering those sounds, you can think, okay, what did I just hear there? I heard you know, I heard a high pitch and it was really loud. Maybe that means that over on the left-hand side as you get into higher frequency, there's something there. Um, from those distinctions, you can make in, uh, inferments, that's not the word. You can make guesses about how patterns are going to look without actually ever seeing the graph, which is the aim of this thing in the first place. Okay, next we're gonna look at the differences between um, the intensities of features. Uh, so again, you can see on the left-hand side, you've got something that has a very um, warm uh, dust cloud very close to it, and so you can see that there's a high-frequency feature, um, which is going to translate to a loud, high-pitched kind of whine deal that you've been hearing. Um, from there, though, you can see that the uh, continuum kind of jerks upward, and so it's a warm thing and then a cool thing, both, at the, both surrounding the same star. And so you could hear those lower uh, pitch, lower frequencies, but you could also hear that high frequency um, chirp at a different intensity. Conversely, again, um, you're gonna be looking at the one on the right-hand side has a much taller feature, and so that has a higher intensity, higher volume. Um, you can also see that over here, the continuum actually drops off, and so those loud, uh, those low pitch, low frequencies are gonna um, fall off and not be as loud. I think the differences between these two are actually um, more powerful in the comparison because you can see how that high feature, or you can hear rather, how that high feature goes from you know, a medium volume up to a big volume and you can actually really hear it. So we're gonna listen to that. And so you could kind of hear how that high frequency just kind of gets louder. And so you're like, all right, there's definitely something there. Um, you know, what are we expecting to see? And so that's just a greater um, conglomeration, essentially, of warm dust surrounding that star. Um, and that's uh, clearly shown in the high volume. 
Lastly, what you're looking at here is um, another model that I built last summer. So 99% of uh, the universe is made up of hydrogen and helium. Everything else that is in your body is the rest of the little 1% of the universe. Um, so a lot of what you're going to be listening to when you look out to the universe is going to be hydrogen and helium. Um, these, what I want you to notice is that these don't have those wide features uh, as the ones we were looking at before. Um, they have very sharp peaks, and so these are going to result in actually more pure tones. Um, I apologize, it's quite shrill. Helium, on the other hand, um, has a couple different energy levels and a couple different um, emissions that are associated with it compared to hydrogen, and so it's going to sound a little different. Again, like I said, you can hear these very pure tones, and so when you're looking at stars, if you hear something like that, rather than a wide um, feature, you're going to be listening to a very pure tone. You can say, okay, maybe there's something else going on here rather than just a big cloud of dust. And so I'm going to play the comparison again. And we're all being called to the Notre Dame. Um, <laughs> So this is an example on the right-hand side of what happens when you actually see these things going on in stars. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got a star that we showed you before. It's, again, a conglomeration of warm dust surrounding the star and kind of orbiting. Um, so again, these are forming solar systems, but this, the one on the left-hand side is much younger than the one on the right-hand side. So I'm going to play that one again. And on the right-hand side, you can see that there are those sharp peaks that I was talking about earlier. And so you can see that rather than those wide features, you've got something more concrete, something that is emitting at a very specific spectrum. Um, and so you can see that this plant, this uh, solar system is being currently formed because it has hydrocarbon molecules, which are building blocks for life that we think were necessary for forming our solar system. That's the reason that we're sitting here. Um, so these are very important and also very um, well marked. So I'm going to play the difference between the two again. You can hear the comparison between the wide feature that kind of has a more blurred sound, I guess is the word I want to go for, as compared to the sharp tone. It's great. Finally, I'm going to talk about how the program that we're working with through sonification kind of has um, a bit of a drawback, and so currently it needs to be worked on that these um, spectra look quite similar, but they have very noticeable differences. So you can see on the left-hand side how this guy has a bunch of bumps and spikes, and as Luke said before, those have very significant um, meaning as compared to the smooth-ish um, continuum over there. Um, so I'm going to play the first one and then the second one. Um, and something that you might notice is that they kind of sound very alike. So here's the first one. Again, you can hear that high um, frequency feature. It has a high intensity, so it has that little whine at the uh, beginning there. And then the second one pretty much sounds the same. Um, so I'm going to play the comparison. If you listen carefully, you can sort of hear them switch from one to the other. Oh. So this is where we need future work to be done. Um, hopefully, we have a couple students in the lab who are looking at this project, um, which is really exciting. I'm glad someone else is taking it up. Um, and we want to be able, in the future, to actually zoom in on these green circled areas and say, OK, what's going on here? How do I listen to this with a uh, greater accuracy? How do I see this and say, there is definitely something different going on here? Because currently, because they kind of sound the same, um, you're not getting the same significance of um, exactly how different these uh, systems are, which is really important because, um, because of those reasons I stated before. Okay, I did promise that there would be um, a room full of astrophysicists, and so unfortunately we have to take a quiz to prove that. Um, so it's only going to be two questions, I think. All right, so judging on what I've been talking about before with the warm dust, the cool dust, things like that, I'm going to play you two different sounds, and I'm just going to have you raise your hands um, and think about which one is the cooler system. And so here's the first one. And here's the second. Now raise your hands if you think that A is cooler. 
Cool. Anyone for B? Sweet. You're correct. Cool as a cucumber. All right, secondly, we're going to ask about molecular features, so those sharp things that I was, looking, I was talking about before. So here's the first one. Bless you. And here's the second. Okay, so raise your hands if you think A has molecular features forming. How about B? Perfect. And there it is. And so this guy is, forming solar, is going to be forming a solar system that has the building blocks of life that we talked about. Okay, to wrap things up, we commonly talk about, um, in, there's a common saying that goes, a picture's worth a thousand words. In astronomy and astrophysics, we talk about how a spectrum is probably worth a thousand pictures. Um, the idea thus far, as um, shown by you guys, is that two general audiences who don't really look at spectra on a daily basis, people who might have visual impairments and need to hear this in order to really understand what's going on, someone with um, a learning disability who needs to experience their education in different ways. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things that are applicable to what we're, what we're seeing here. And so we're going to say that a sound is probably worth a thousand graphs. Thank you so much. Questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> Um, to my knowledge, uh, the only student who has, um, who actually originally built this program was actually a dual major in physics and music. Um, actually, no, it was Jeffrey Porzio. Um, so he was the one who originally wrote this program, um, and from there I kind of picked it up and started working with it about a year ago, actually. Um, other than that, we really haven't had too much collaboration with different departments just because the project is so new. Um, <sighs> We would love to. That would be great. Um, worldwide, this is actually a global field, and so it actually does um, collaborate with a lot of people in a lot of different fields. And so it encompasses people in computer science, in psychology of learning, um, in acoustics, uh, other things like that. Um, there's an international conference on auditory display that happens once a year, and so you have a lot of different specialists that show up to those kinds of conferences and talk about different um, specialties they have within sonification. So on this campus, no. Um, worldwide, absolutely. Yeah. I actually haven't thought about that. Um, I know that Jeffrey had a bunch of different in the code when I was looking at it and learning it last year, um, there were a lot of different options that Jeff kind of coded in, but we went with a, just one. Um, so it might be that he decided to work with different ones um, and then decided against them for whatever reason it may be. Um, so that would be absolutely a topic worth exploring.
yeah. telescopes, which are visually magnificent. Mm -hmm. But it, it makes people think that if you go out there and pair of you can see those. Uh, if we hear these, these beautiful sounds, do we imagine that we would sort of be able to open the windows, you know, roll down the windows on our spacecraft and hear that? Well, I hope you don't roll down the window in a spacecraft, <laughs> but. <laughs> I mean, what we're doing is not rocket science, or rather, kind of is rocket science. But we want to say, you you can do it too, because that's one of my that's one of my big I'm like gung ho. Like you you guys can understand this, and it's super exciting. Um, I agree with Luke. Any other questions? Alrighty, thank you guys so much for coming here.